Hello everyone, this is Kevin Jones uh, from the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising. I'm the curator everybody here on the West Coast and good afternoon to everybody on the East Coast and of course, good evening to all those who are overseas and hi Christina. Hi, good morning. <laughs> Welcome from the office. <laughs> yes, I'm sitting here in my office and I hope the reception is okay. Yeah, it's, it's perfect for, on my end, definitely. Good. Um, so we are, just everybody knows, we're definitely socially distanced today, because as you can tell, I'm at home. Uh, but uh, welcome to a very cloudy, gloomy, rainy Southern California. This is not our normal sunny weather where I'm bombarded with morning sun. So today I wore a sky blue tie in honor of um, the typical Southern California day. <laughs> <laughs> So Christina, we're going to talk about photography today and all of the little tricks that we have come up with and little tricks, you know, that we've seen other institutions do that we've incorporated into our own um, way of working. So um, if anybody has questions, you know, while we're going along, please feel, to, to, uh, feel free to add them to the, the feed here and we'll try to answer them. But we do have a list of questions that was sent in by uh, uh, our different viewers over this past week. And also what's interesting is how many questions are asked repeatedly um, by everybody, it, it seems. And so let's just start off um, with question number one, which is wearing gloves while handling objects, yay or nay? And this is a question that we get all the time. Well, so Christina, how do you how do you handle our object? Sure, I mean it depends on the object. It depends on what we're doing with the object. Um, I, I tend to wear nitro gloves in our office handling things. But if something is yes, exactly those blue gloves that are quite tight fitting. But if something is delicate, um, I do not wear gloves. I wash my hands. I take off jewelry that might cut um, clothing. And uh, I don't wear those gloves. So, uh, yeah, it just really depends on what you're doing. And sometimes when you wear gloves, you lose the tactile sensation of the hands. Um, so sometimes you don't want to. Right. And there's another kind of glove that's kind of more typical. It's kind of the jazz hand <laughs> glove. <laughs> you know? oh, right. So we've got both. Right. Uh, you know, it's the white, the white cotton glove. Now, there are different kinds of white and cotton gloves. I mean, they're, there's like the old school kind that didn't have any fit at all. I mean, you could barely kind of keep them on your hand. You had to keep tugging. These have the little points on the back, which kind of fit the hand better and more tightly, so they stay on more. Um, th there's, you know, I, 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 I agree with Christina. It's like, I really don't like wearing gloves if I don't have to because you really, especially with the cotton gloves, uh, you lose all that feeling. Um, kind of our rule is if we're just examining something, it's always nice to maybe put gloves on. We don't have to use, we're not trying to dress it or something. And especially with something that has metal elements. Um, however, for me, Christina, I don't know if this is for you. I tend, I don't know why, I tend to like to wear the cotton gloves when I'm dealing with the metal mm. versus the plastic, because I'm not certain, I'm scared that the, the metal and, this, and the whatever is, you know, the latex might interact somehow. Sure. So I always feel comfortable with more with the cotton gloves, because I know literally nothing's going to react with that. And I do want to say, not only do we wear gloves to protect the objects, but we wear gloves to at times protect ourselves. If something is made of fur, we don't know what that has been processed with. Sometimes things that are right. a deep green have been processed with arsenic. I'm talking about the 19th century. So it's really yeah. important to also protect our own bodies from some of these things coming in that might have preservatives or mildew or insects on them. Yeah, exactly. No, it's a really, really important point. It's the, it's to, to it's to protect us as much as anything else. And I know that like um, our registrars, whenever they're processing something in the office, they're always wearing gloves. We have boxes of gloves everywhere, so you can all. It's always convenient. I always hated having to go and find a pair of gloves right when I needed them. So we kind of now have them all over, and I recommend that for for everybody. The one thing I have to say about the cotton gloves that I that is really 
not the best. For one thing is the fit, like I mentioned. But um, you can snag on the cotton gloves. Also, elements that might be like embroidery bits or something like that. And also, the gloves get kind of soiled. You know, these, are, these have been washed. I pulled these out of our washed gloves. And I always think, are, are they still dirty? You know, because sometimes you really handle an object and a lot of crud comes off or something or other, and you can't, you can't really get that out of the glove again. So these are smoother. Um, they can get kind of weird to wear because your hands get sweaty. But um, that's, that is the FITM museum way of dealing with gloves. But I will say, during dressing for photography, I tend to not wear gloves, um, unless it's no. for those materials that I need to protect myself from. But I don't wear gloves yeah. because I want to feel the object, see how it's sliding onto the mannequin or onto that padding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, totally. So that is the FITM museum take about gloves. So I'm now going to take off the gloves. OK. <laughs> 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 and these, you know, it's like going to surgery and you just wheel them off. And if anything got on the glove, it's now safely inside and you can just throw these away. Um, all right. So question number two, because we have a lot of visuals today and I want to hope we can get yeah, to Yeah, I hope so. All right. <clears throat> How do you go about styling a mannequin from head to toe? Is there always a reference image, such as a photo, fashion plate, or painting that you look at? Uh, great question. And the answer is absolutely yes. <laughs> yes, we always work from visual sources. That might be something that we've seen 20 years ago or something that we're researching yeah. specifically for that ensemble. But always, yeah. we work from a, a variety of sources. And it might not be copying one source. It might be like I mentioned, a variety of fashion plates and visual imagery, but always, we always work from sources. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I have an example here okay. that I want to show everybody. I've got four images. So, um, and these are, this is in the sporting fashion. Uh, let's go right to the commercial. Oh. <laughs> here is the catalog. Oh my God. Really, I know that we've been saying that we've been working on this project for years and years and decades and decades. But actually, we were, and here it is. And this is the only copy we have. This is now our, our office copy. It's an advanced, advanced, advanced copy. And um, the advanced copies will be coming next month. And then the catalog is supposed to be released um, to the public March 2nd. So uh, if you haven't pre-ordered Amazon, you can do so. Um, so the outfit I want to show you is actually in sporting fashion. and. Um, it started out with, of course, doing research on the, the ensembles we wanted in the, the project, right? So obviously we wanted writing habits. And this is um, one of the earliest depictions of the writing habit for us because the, the project starts 1800 to 1960. So as you can see, this fashion plate from uh, Custom Prisienne, um, you know, the ladies sitting a horse looking absolutely very jock jocular um, and uh, it's just fantastic. The thing that really amazed me about this is that, you know, she was wearing this kind of white, white cotton day gown, which is not something I actually would have thought somebody would have worn because, you know, with kicking up mud or dirt or whatever, you know, you think your dress would get quite dirty, but there are multiple fashion plates that show women wearing um, these writing ensembles that incorporated a, a white cotton gown with a, a writing spencer, a little jockey cap. Um, so we were fortunate enough to find and be able to put together an outfit that mimicked the the outfit that you see in some of these fashion plates. Well, we found it. Uh, Stephen Porterfield helped us to find this uh, very sturdy white cotton gown with this beautiful inter integrated neck ruffle. That neck ruffle is not separate. I've never seen one that flipped up and also down at the same time. Our uh, director, Barbara Bundy, thank you very, very much, bought us this incredibly rare chip writing hat with its cockade. We acquired the writing spencer, which is from France, from um, private collector, and then you have the gown. This photo is the test dress of the ensemble for photography. 
you know, it's like, does it all work? What's the pose going to be? How's the styling? Do we have all of the elements that, that are required? And if you notice here, she doesn't have any shoes and she needs shoes. So she wasn't actually ready yet for photography because we hadn't found the shoes. That's right. And what we do. Then we found the shoes. Well, I do want to say that. And it all worked together. Well, what, Christina? I mentioned that we do this test dress so that we can walk around it and literally take photos with our phones to try and see the right angle, to see what angle would be the most beautiful for this particular silhouette. And we'll stand there and take those photos so that we can save time yeah. during the photo shoot and already know the exact placement on that photography paper because time is money, right? We need to make yes. sure that we and, and that's a really, really time. good point. Mm -hmm. Right, because um, cell phones are so great. You know, we, we may have an idea about how it's going to look best, and then you take a photo of it, and you look at it on your phone, and you're like, actually, this doesn't read well. One of our um, kind of main goals in photography, always, uh, because of the, the kind of projects that we do, um, and we want to pile so much into it that we, we really often only have room for one photo of an outfit or an object. And therefore, especially for sporting fashion, you needed to be able to read the entire ensemble head to toe in one photo. There are very, very few photos where, of an object where you have more than one angle because we just didn't have the room in the book. And so as Christina mentioned, it's really important for us to be able to determine before photography, before we're in the photo studio, to, to know exactly what we're going to be doing. Um, so then thinking of the styling here, I'm gonna jump into also a, the posing and, and we, we've got some other examples about posing. Um, I found this fashion plate which I thought was really charming. Christina, did I ever show you this? No, you didn't. This is news to me. I, know, I, I, I can't believe I never showed this to you. And this is actually how I came up with the pose. So here is this woman and she is in a writing habit. Uh, and this is a matched habit with, with the Spencer and the skirt uh, matching. And you can see her, she's holding her writing whip right there. But that is the pose that I thought was so charming one of the things that Christina and I um, talked about really early on before photography actually started was showing some garments from the back because so often we just, you know, this is the front, it's the front view all the time. But so much of the detail and of these garments is very interesting uh, uh, all the way around, we know. And again, we cannot show too many angles of one garment, we didn't have the room. So we really chose which garments were gonna be photographed from the front and those that were gonna be photographed from the back according to what most information we wanted to get across. And then here is the final photo of it all together. So here is our styling, head to toe. Now she has her slippers, she has a pair of gloves on. And here is, you can read the whole outfit, top to bottom in one image. And also you can see that not only did we style it according to period sources, but we posed it according to period sources as well. Yes, yeah, so definitely so, multiple sources. Looking beautiful with the, the gown steamed out, holding her very rare riding whip, all the way down to the little leather slippers that she was wearing. And um, because the dress is semi-sheer, Carolyn Jamerson, our mount maker, actually made an undergown for this to be when it's finally dressed. So this is a kind of a wonderful, perfect example of how it is that we go about in a really, you know, simple but completely documented way of doing um, our styling. And I do want to mention that when we put the mannequin on that paper, we don't just plop it down and it's good to go. Getting that train to look as beautiful as it does with all of the undulations, that is all planned. It's not just you know, stuck down. Sometimes we'll even place the mannequin, extend the train, and then turn the mannequin because that gives a, a realistic, um, that's how the train would have been in real life. So we want to have this easy elegance and not have things be too forced. Uh, I just thought I would add that. That is 100% correct. I mean, 
one one thing that we strove for because we did decide early on also that we wanted to dress head to toe and that's a that is a curatorial decision you know we could have just maybe dress the the spencer and the and the dress and that that could have been enough to show what a woman wore riding kind of basically but of course no woman ever went out in just those elements she she was dressed head to toe and you know we've also done other shows where it was just the uh, just a garment was spotlighted no other accessories or anything so you know it's a curatorial choice that needs to be made you know pretty early on and it's also another reason why this project took so long is that we need to define all of the elements and as christina said one of the main reasons to do this was to showcase the whole woman the whole period the whole look in the most naturalistic way possible and the poses are really difficult we also wanted to incorporate a sense of movement which i think is very difficult when you're in a photo which is completely static on a mannequin that is just standing there you know how do you give a sense of movement i mean she does look like she is kind of motioning forward moving forward and you can do that by posing your dress i mean we specifically had this line right here when we were you know adjusting the skirt christina saw like oh look how beautiful that look it also gives that sweep which helped to give a sense <clears throat> excuse me of movement and you know it's all these kind of just little little tricks because you know she could look very beautiful and then this hand is kind of going er and it it kind of completely obliterates the the rest of the elegance and naturalism yeah. um, so it's, it's tricky and yeah. it just it takes time and each mannequin is different we had we had um we had you know situations with each mannequin there were not problems but um each mannequin presented its own challenges uh for how we wanted to present the the ensemble Yeah, it is tricky. So in addition to making sure that all of the elements are the correct time period and they also are aesthetically pleasing together, I think it's important during photography to take a step back and look at the form on the paper, just the abstract form. And I think that's what you were alluding to when you mentioned that one deep curved crease because if your eye follows that crease, you can find other elements of the the um mannequin that mirror that such as the shoulder or the back of the head and so there's this balance and i think it's it's important to take that time and really look when you're doing a yes. photo shoot so i would actually like to now kevin bring up an image of a photo shoot so they can see what goes on all around that beautiful image which has been cropped color corrected and gone through photoshop i actually have one here um This is an example of a photo shoot. You can see another outdoor girl at the center there on the gray. You can see me just to the side wearing my yoga clothes. Usually we do this on the weekends. Oh, I should mention that we do this on the weekends and during breaks because we generally photograph during uh, in in classrooms. So we need to utilize those classrooms when class is not in session. So you can see all of the photography equipment with the camera right at the center. So we're always scurrying around making the adjustments and then once those photos are taken we go over to a desk where there is a computer set up and immediately look at the photo on the desk and make adjustments and we'll make a list of adjustments move this you know piece of hair move this fringe adjust this and make those I think you're in here too Kevin are you in here maybe it's just me make those um, adjustments I don't see myself oh. maybe I'm taking the photo oh, here you are <laughs> Here you are. You oh, there I am. See where okay. Kevin is. There's the computer. Oh, the computer. Mhm. So that's uh what the setup looks like for us. And it's and you know, as Christina said, we we photograph in between class sessions and we love being in that one space and that is rooms 305 and 306 <laughs> and we break one of the walls open so we have a really big space because Brian our photographer can be in one half of the room and we're in the back with all the other mannequins and making adjustments sometimes we're dressing something um tying on accessories whatever and so it's a really great space but we don't always have that space and we have had to photograph down in the gallery um when the gallery is is closed to the public we have photographed in other rooms in the building and you know we just because we don't have a permanent uh, photography studio 
And, you know, you kind of make do with what you've got. We definitely know how to move around in each of the general spaces now because of uh, setting things up. Those classrooms, I don't know if you can see from the photo, but they have windows all the way across. And of course, if there is sunlight, yeah, you can see. And we put up um, the huge pieces of the black foam core to, to block most of the light because you don't want, you know, the sunlight streaming through, for one thing, onto the objects. But also, it, you know, if we're taking a photograph, you don't want that, you know, some bright sunlight suddenly messing up the beautiful atmospheric lighting that, that uh, we're trying to achieve. You know, so we've, we, we work all different angles in, in order to, to get the, the shots that are required because we don't have a dedicated space. But it also, you know, frankly, it makes it really fun. It, I always enjoy that photography week when we, we have to move in. And we usually try to set up as much as possible Friday before Monday we tend, tend to shoot. And then we know Fridays are a half day because we have to tear everything down. Uh, Christina, I think it's important to let everybody know how many photos that we generate or ensembles we generally are able to get through in a week. Um, right. Well, it, what yeah. do you what? Sure. What do we normally do? We we do about twenty max. So we yeah. do about four per day. Uh, it depends on the style. It depends on is this is if, is this a shot for our blog that needs to be beautiful, but maybe not take a ton of time as it would for publication. But generally, we do about four mannequins a day, and that's already they're already dressed. We, you know, that yeah. means that we would have organized this shoot two to three weeks before dressing mannequins after pulling all of the different objects. Um, and then there's post-production afterwards, uh, you know, adjusting shadows and lighting and that kind of thing. But right. generally no more than 20 mannequins in one week. And, um, and I think even 20, that's, that's, that's when we have a really good week, good I think, week. with a good five mannequins that are very easy to shoot. And you know, photography is so important for museums because the exhibitions we do are ephemeral. And because of the virus, we're entering into a whole new landscape of museum exhibitions and how often we can do museum exhibitions, how we can do them safely. And obviously people cannot travel to all the exhibitions that they would like. So photography has taken on even more importance, what we choose to photograph, how we photograph, it's, it's just really important for museums, an important topic and a hot topic right now. Yeah, because that's how we get out now. That's how our collections get out. We live and through uh, I know. I said, the, what was the that? Fitta Museum exists through photography. This is how most people learn about our museum and other institutions are those digital assets that you're able to share with the audience. Right. And, um, you know, we have spent half an hour on one mannequin shooting it. And we're all amazed like, wow, wait, how did we pose it and shoot it and everything kind of came together. And I think the longest we've ever spent on a single mannequin was also for sporting fashion. And it's the Adrian, we have a 1948 Adrian lounging ensemble. And it took us five hours, I remember to shoot that thing. I mean, it was so, you know, when you look back at the photo, I mean, it's so beautiful and it looks kind of very effortless, but it was so difficult to shoot that for whatever reason, the lighting. I remember we kept moving the, the mannequin just slightly, ever, we were kind of rotating it, trying to find exactly the right angle that we could show every element that we needed to. And it was just really difficult. So, you know, at times you don't know exactly what it's going to take, but you just have to, you know, prepare for everything. Okay, we need to move on. Yes. Um, so we talked about styling. Um, there's a, I, can we talk about uh, posing the mannequin just one more time? Because I just want to show the, the, the one other example that I have that's also from Sporting Fashion. And it's actually the photo that Joanna, our so, Joanna Abichaudi, our social media uh, manager posted for our talk. So here is Kevin and Christina and we're on set. So actually in the back, this is the other back of the room. This is where we are generally. And see, here's another mannequin here waiting to be photographed. So here we are posing one of the mannequins. And this is the mannequin arm. And what we're, what we're trying to, to set up here is a cricketing bat, which is really damn heavy. 
If you've ever lifted a cricketing bat, they are so heavy, much heavier than a normal kind of baseball bat. And oh, and I don't know, can you see here kind of going through my, my head is what Christina is holding is monofilament. So this is fishing line and it comes in various weights. It can be kind of thick and it can be really, really thin like to hold up jewelry pieces or whatever. And we use, I, I would say, for photography, monofilament and tissue are our best friends. Yes. Um, you know, if, if a sleeve is slightly collapsing, you know, you shove tissue up underneath. But if you need to hold something like this, monofilament. Now, this is what the, the final look. Here is our cricketing lady from the mid 1890s. And uh, you know, she's got the, the sport cap on, she's got her terrific blouse, her, her ankle length skirt. She, these are cricketing gloves that to me look like pretzels. Um, they're leather. And she has her skeleton guards on, which are to protect her shins. And here is the cricketing bat. Now, this is post Photoshop, because as Christina mentioned earlier about photography, where there's always Photoshop later. And we had the monofilament holding the cricketing bat and we're putting it in place and tying it onto the mannequin's hand. So again, tying the mannequin's hand to the bat, but the bat is being held up by actually there were two lines of monofilament because the thing was so heavy. There's no way that we could have posed this mannequin with the bat up. No. It, should, it was just way too heavy even for the monofilament. So I thought, okay, we need to have a period correct man stance. And I found this great print of these women cricketers, British in the 1890s, you know, and they're in all of these great poses. Here's the, here's the bowler, you know, and she's getting ready to, to hit the, the ball, different poses and so forth. And, you know, with uh, catching the ball, but here, is the, the image that we chose to use as posing our mannequin because you've got the correct period pose with the resource, but also the bat is down on the floor because it's so heavy. Our mannequin was not going to be able to hold it. It would actually tip the mannequin. It was so heavy, um, but it's still correct. So it, it's, it, it was a, the right solution for then having our mannequin in a correct pose for the, uh, the ensemble. So there's one of our examples uh, of having to have a solution. I mean, I would have loved her up, you know, batting the ball or something rather, but it just wasn't gonna happen. But to be able to do it and still be correct um, is something that we really were excited to be able to do and using those, those elements that with digital photography can then be um, eliminated later. Yes, and speaking about digital photography, so obviously our photographer edited out those monofilament lines and any shadows they would have um, caught. Uh, and what I want to show is something that is actually really annoying to me in terms of Photoshop. And we talked about this last night. This is one of our pieces from the Fitta Museum collection. It is an 1860s course. It matches my tie. Yeah, it looks good. It looks good together. And uh, it's on a wonderful invisible mount that our mount maker, Carolyn Jamerson, has made. So the piece looks great. And this is all over the internet. Lots of people like to put this on Instagram and on their Pinterest. But what really annoys me are those two little threads. They're actually, um, oh, I'm blanking. Oh, twill tape, uh, archival twill tape, yeah. because the original twill tape did not it, um, survive. And I wish that we had photoshopped that twill tape out because looking at the image, I'll hold it back. My eye goes right to that twill tape and it yeah. really destroys the image for me. I'm happy that lots of people like this piece, but I got to tell you, it really annoys me because we released this image without photoshopping. And once an image is online, it's completely out of our control. So, and then yeah. I'll show you an image of it. We did use it for some, um, fundraising and it looks great on the fundraising piece because we edited out the twill tape. <laughs> yeah. So that's what it's supposed to look like. Um, there you go. <laughs> and it annoys me, Christina, that during the photo shoot, why I did not tuck up 
the, the twill tape in the back because then you also don't have to worry about photoshopping it later and it would have been nice I'm and finished i mean you. it's just something it, that happened we released the image and now it's out there so i feel like we need to re-release it photoshopped <laughs> you know as much as you plan in any project and especially with photography i tell you you think it's great, you're happy with it, you leave the photo studio, two weeks later you look at the photo again and your eye goes to one element that you're like, how did I not see that? So you gotta give yourself a break well, I have as well. One. You know what I, I mean? I have another one. So for our high style Betsy Bloomingdale and the Old Couture exhibition, this is one of our uh, invisible mounts, a wonderful Galano suit that she wore. Um, on its stand and we made, uh, Carolyn made all of these wonderful mounts and you can see that the base, the stand is not at the center. And that is because the form we used had legs. And so the black pole goes up one of the legs. So we photographed all these pieces and they just looked really odd and unbalanced, right? Yeah. It just, it doesn't quite work. So in the high style catalog, we had them all photoshopped. Here are two Givenchy pieces, and you can see that pole has magically been aligned at center in post. So again, the magic of, of post and making things work. Because and we have to thank uh, our, our, so we have two photographers. They're both named Brian. We've decided that we can never work with a photographer now unless their name is Brian, right? <laughs> so Brian Sanderson photographed um, the pieces for us for the Betsy catalog, High Style. And Brian Sanderson and Brian Davis did the photography for Sporting Fashion. However, Brian Sanderson did all of our post-digital work. And we love our photographers because they are the best in the world and they are so much fun to work with. And they sometimes despair of our requests, but they always come through and figure out solutions that bring the vision to life. And we just want to give them a big we shout do. out. We <laughs> love working with them so much. And I will also bring up this other image. Um, this, this is really fun. This was a fun challenge that we brought to our photographers for Outdoor Girls. So I think it would be fun to talk about this. This is a real Vespa that we managed to get upstairs uh, into a FITM classroom <laughs> and photograph for our wonderful Poochie Ensemble for Outdoor Girls. And so figuring out how to make this work with the mannequin, making sure that fit from the lighting, the stability uh, was a lot of fun. And I wanna point out what I'm wearing. Um, you know, photography days are really long days. So you wanna make sure that you can move, that you feel comfortable. Sometimes I'm crawling around on my hands and knees, dealing with shoes. And we also want to try and keep that gray paper as pristine as possible because that makes for right. fewer post touch-ups. You can see those blue things on my feet, which I actually have right here and they're just shoe covers. They're shoe covers, you can put them over your socks also and it protects that paper a bit as we're, as we're working. But this was a real fun challenge and you can see all of the lines yeah. on that. Yeah, I can't believe it was fun. Um, <laughs> and so I'll just give you a little behind the scenes story there that, you know, we, we found the correct period 50s Vespa. Think, think of Roman Holiday and Gregory Peck and Audrey Hepburn. And that's kind of what we were going for. And, and the, the mannequin is wearing a full Pucci ensemble from her helmet to her outfit from the 1950s. It's really rare, great. Uh, and, you know, we wanted to pose it and we, we, wondered like, okay, did we need to construct a mannequin to actually sit? And then Christina and I were on our um, Orange County campus in the back where some mannequins were stored. And we found this mannequin that was exactly the pose that we needed for a seated look on a Vespa. And it looks like she's just stopped her Vespa and she's literally about to take her sunglasses off and she's about to get off the Vespa and go, you know, shop or do whatever. And, you know, there's always a story also. That's another thing. We all, Brian, the, our Brian's photo photographers, they always want to know what the story is of the ensemble that we're shooting because that helps them somehow with the lighting and, and so forth, like what type of the, what time of the day is it? Is this early morning? Is it, is it the, you know, the, the evening sunset? 
So that's another thing to keep in mind. And you know, it's like with this Vespa, she's in the middle of the day, she's out, she's in Rome. Um, and, and you know, it, it helps all of us to kind of get into it. Um, so found the Vespa, the guy that we bought, rented it from, drove it over and um, I got it in one of our elevators, much to the chagrin of our um, security, don't tell anybody. <laughs> and took it up in the elevator to the third floor where we were shooting and we rolled it in and I was terrified it was going to drip something, you know, but um, it was great and it worked out and, you know, and then I just apologized later, <laughs> but we have this great shot. So it's kind of, you got to do what you have to do when you, when you have that vision of photography. <laughs> so, uh, but again, don't tell anybody. Um, so, you know, actually, and that kind of goes with one of the questions, Christina, is, um, you know, how long does it take to photograph a mannequin? We, we kind of talked about that, but also what were the biggest challenges during the photo shoots? Um, but another thing that I want to talk about is, all right, here we're showing, Christina, these really beautiful shots. We've, we've prepared them, we've, we've styled them, we've posed them, and we're ready to go. Christina, I have a question for you. Do we ever photograph our mannequins more than once? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Because sometimes you sit with that finished image and it just doesn't sit right, you know? And I don't know about you, but sometimes when I'm driving, I, that's when I get my inspiration. And I guess I'm focusing on but I'm too. also just thinking about photography or other things. I'm like, you know, we need to reshoot that or this. I can't, I can't live with this one. And I do have an example right. of that here of a, of a reshoot. This dress dates to the 1880s, and it is from the Helen Larson Historic Fashion Collection. It's a wonderful Maison Felix piece, lots of embroidery, a huge bustle. And you can see here it is. This is just in a box, just laying out in a box. And you know, this image, it's okay for a database shot because at least it's an image. At least it shows us, it shows us, you know, basically what it looks like for research purposes but it's flat, it's not very exciting. So we did shoot it, um, we did photograph it. And here's that photograph on a Kyoto mannequin. We have a feather headpiece, we added a fan, um, and it's, it's beautifully dressed. You know, it looks, it, I'll hold it back so you can see the whole thing. You know, um, I think the angle we chose was pretty. It shows the, the, the largest point of the bustle, but something just didn't feel right with this. And then we were lucky enough to acquire a few more mannequins that were larger, larger in size than the yep. Kyoto mannequin. I think the Kyoto mannequin size- Bigger in the bust. Yeah, the Kyoto mannequin was, uh, I think only a 34 inch bust at the max. And then we acquired this mannequin. This is the same dress. This is a different photo shoot and a different mannequin. The mannequin is more buxom. Um, and we also slightly changed the styling. Hopefully I can get both of these together. I'm kind of peeking out the center here. Um, we changed the styling a little bit. I was not happy with the fan sticking out. I thought it looked a bit awkward. My eye went right to the fan instead of the garment. Um, right. I, I like the fit of the garment more. And also you can see we took a little more time with the skirt. Do you see on the later image that the loops of ribbon are slightly wider and more plumped up? than on the older image. Well, that's because we put tissue in between those ribbons and then steamed it just a little bit more. We took just a bit more time with this. I also like the, the feathers sticking straight up as opposed to the side. Right. To, ma to my mind, I, um, this, the feather here looks a little knocked over like she was in a crowded drawing room and needed to get it together afterwards. And here, she's much more statuesque. And then getting into the lighting, the lighting on the later image is much more dramatic with much deeper shadows. And I think that that lighting really does a positive service to the later image. So yes, we do reshoot things because we obsess and we want these objects to look as beautiful as they possibly can. But- And for that second photo shoot, one of the, the, the reasons why the lighting was different is because again, we told a story to our photographer and we said, you know what? Actually, she would be at this time in a ballroom with huge gas or in the, at the opera, because we think this is an opera gown, with those huge gasoliers, those huge glass crystal chandeliers. And that, that is the lighting then that he captured 
in the second shoot instead of this kind of more flat overall lighting. So again, that story that we told helped to give him the sense of where this woman was, what was the day, time of the day, what was the environment she was in, and that then, I don't know, brought to life this aspect which is much more elegant and atmospheric and in keeping with the area she would have been in and the type of lighting that would have um, uh, lit the gown. There's nothing wrong so. with this image. This image is beautiful, mm. it showcases the gown, but it doesn't have magic. This image has the magic in it. And that's one of the things that we're constantly striving for is, I use this word and maybe it's a little archaic, but for me it's that the image has charm. It doesn't matter what, what we're photographing, if it's a, a pair of shoes or it's a ball gown or if it's a day dress or whatever. Are we capturing the charm? Are we capturing maybe the, maybe essence is a better term. Are we capturing the essence of what the object is supposed to be from its time period? Not as we're interpreting it today. We are, we know that, we, we, we recognize that. But are we trying to get it back to how it would have appeared by the people at whatever time would have seen it as well? So one of our viewers, Pattern Play USA, Lee Wishner, who is also um, our registrar, re just reminded me of a phrase that I came up with, what? especially with sporting fashion, and that is emergency photo shoot. <laughs> right. Well, you know, like I mentioned, we, sh uh, we do photography in classrooms, so we have limited amounts of time for that. And we have limited amounts of time for photography. And for outdoor girls, we kept adding photo shoots. You know, there were more adjustments that we wanted to make. There were more mannequins we needed to include. And so it was just this, this kind of inside joke when you would say, we need an emergency photo shoot. And we'd all try and get it together. And we did make it happen. And at the end of the day, it made for a more successful project. But, you know, photo shoots take a lot of energy. And it's not just you and me and our photographer there. Everyone helps out. You know, we need help moving the mannequins or being a runner and, it's just, it's a lot of work, but it's worth it. Yeah, that's true. It's not just Kevin and Christina on set with our photographer. No, everybody in the, in the um, museum office helps, definitely. Christi Carolyn dresses for us if suddenly we need a certain kind of mount or something done because we hadn't anticipated how something needed to be held. Um, yeah, Joanna and Lee are, you know, it's like, oh, we need something that's down in the office, which is on the second floor. We're on the third floor. Sometimes we're on the fifth floor. So we need somebody to run uh, to get something. That's really, really important. Those, those individuals just contribute so much to, to help the photo shoot run smoothly, but also to keep us on track that we can get through photographing those 20 objects that we prepped over, you know, a couple of week time period is really, really important to have that backup um, for you on set. Yes, I, um, and I think we ended up with five emergency photo shoots right. because um, we kept adding things or wanted to reshoot things for sporting fashion. Um, Christina, I do want us to get to one um, outfit that you have some photos for, and I have some photos okay. for, and that's the red okay. fern. Can we talk about that? Yes, we can. We can. Do you want me to start with the photo? Yeah. Yes, okay. Here is the object we will be talking about. It is a red fern court gown. Is this 1906 or 07? I'm blanking on the exact date. 1907. Thank you, 1907. And you can see that we've, we're test dressing it on a Kyoto mannequin. Um, and it's just on there in our museum storage. So posing, so even something that is very, you know, that's just a gown. It's pretty straightforward. It's not going to be in some elaborately um, posed way, the way we tried to do with sporting fashion. But the, the garments can often be the challenge, not the mannequin, the pose, or, or doing any mounts, anything else. Um, this gown looks lovely here, but what's also incorporated into it is an 11-foot-long court train. And you can't see that here. <laughs> and 
What was that? You cannot see the train here. So this would be an example of a, a poor angle. <laughs> this is a poor yeah. photography angle because it doesn't do justice. So we actually acquired the court gown um, at auction. And one of our uh, early supporters, Yvonne Hummel, bought and she and her, her son acquired it for us. And it was in Fabulous, um, our catalog from 2011. And we, we were able, because it's such a grand garment, we were able to shoot it in more than one way. We knew that we, want, we needed to present this in all of its glory. What's amazing is that we have a photo of the woman who, or I gotta stand up for this, who originally wore this. Her name was Bloomfield Gamble Post. And here she is in a photography studio in London and her gown, uh, you know, just before she was presented at Buckingham Palace before Queen Alexandra and uh, Edward VII. Now that doesn't always happen that we actually have a photo of the person wearing the gown. So we knew we wanted to replicate the, the photo. And so that's why Christina was showing you the shot of when we were dressing it and starting to test, was it going to work um, as well? And here's the train. And you can see that we tried to mimic that and that they would then mirror each other. Now, because this garment was so big, we could not be in our normal photo studio place. So we actually were in our smallest gallery, which is gallery number two, but it's big. And we had the wall painted gray because we were using the gray paper. And you know, there's yellow paper and white paper and there's all sorts of different colored background papers. You, you have to choose what you want your look to, to be. We tend to like to be consistent and gray works nicely. This kind of um, medium gray because it, with lighting, it can go light, light gray looking in the photo or it can go black. So there, there's a really nice kind of range. Um, so, but we painted our wall the gray color and then pieced together the gray paper because we needed to be so wide and taped it onto the wall to create that kind of curvature so you don't have a, a, a horizon line. And then photographed her because that train was so big. But this wasn't even the challenging shot I got to do this and hold my, hold the book. This was the challenging shot <laughs> here because we knew we wanted the entire train out um, in all of its glory. Like she was walking into the, uh, the drawing room at Buckingham palace about to, you know, curtsy to queen Alexandra. And this was incredibly challenging to do. Uh, because of getting that whole train, but also because the photo is so big, Brian had to be very far back with his camera in order for the shot to be in focus from this point all the way to this point, um, which is very challenging. So that was a photo shoot we did with this one garment. There was nothing else that we were going to be shooting. And I think it took us two full days to do, to, and it might've been, do you remember Christine, was it two or three days? Cause I remember the setup and we posed her and that took so long. I don't know if we got any shots in that day. I don't think so. I think, it, I don't remember if it was two days or three days. Uh, but what I will yeah. say is it's an example of really the, the rhythm of photography. So what generally happens is that we will pre-dress the items, you know, prepare the objects. Kevin and I will place them on the photography paper and then we'll take 10 minutes, even an hour to start just really looking at it, going from head to toe and making sure everything yeah. is perfect. There are no wrinkles. There's the same amount of negative space between each, let's say, um, sleeve that the hair is balanced. Like it's literally from head to toe. We go up close, we step back, we're, you know, futzing with it and then we is turn it over to the photographer. After telling that story yeah. about what lighting should be like or where this person is, then the photographer takes over and they walk all around, they move all the lights, they, you know, take the photo, it's, it's, it's in their hands. And then we, we go to that computer screen and look, and we all talk about it. What needs to be adjusted? What do we need to fix or change? What do we like? What do we not like? And then it starts all over again. So it's this real dance 
Um, usually we try and bring work um, while our photographer is shooting because it can take a while. So we'll just be sitting back at some tables and I'll be researching or something and then, but always on call, always available. And uh, it's a really good point Christina brings up about having to give over to the photographer. You know, and there are times where truly that one of the Bryans is taking two or three hours to get the shot that, that they are, they want to show us. Neither one of those Bryans ever show us photos while they're working out their lighting scheme. They're not, they, they, do, they don't want us around. They literally want to, to, we tell them the vision, we tell them the story, then we, they are doing their work. And they don't want us to see the shots that they're not happy with, you know, before we get together. And another thing Christina just brought up, which is so important, and is something that I learned from our photographers, and that is the use of negative space. You know, it's not just the object you're shooting. You are actually composing an image. So if, if you're just thinking you're just, oh, we're shooting a dress. And it's the dress that you're concentrating on instead of the image, the, 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 because the dress is not going to exist anymore. The dress will be put into a box. What you're doing is you're creating an image of an object. And you've got to think about the negative space, the composition, the proportions that are, used, that, that are being used. Another thing that's really important that I learned from our photographers is, the, is where the camera is placed. <laughs> is the camera here? Is the camera up here looking more down on the piece? Or is the camera down here looking more up to the piece? Do you want the camera looking up the nose of your mannequin? You know, I mean, all of that really plays into what your final product is going to be. And you need to be aware of all those things. Another thing Christina said early on in our talk, which I think is so important, is to be able to look at your your, your manic, dressed mannequin or the object you're shooting in an abstract mm -hmm. way. Don't just look at the shoes. Look at what is the silhouette of the back of the shoe and the heel making on this side of the photo. You don't need to look at the shoes. Look, you, got, you, know, you have to break down your object components and look at those individually. And like Christina said, step back then and look at the whole. It's really important and it will help you to um, create a better image. Like for example, I think that this image is a very successful image. This is a wonderful gown, part of the Helen Larson Historic Fashion Collection, a very special piece. And I think it's, it's successful. We wanted to have an extreme lighting. The lighting works for the aerofane, the sheer fabric. I think it is a balanced image. And by the way, this is a second shoot of something. I, I'm sorry, yes, I did is. print out the first one, but this is the second um, image. I love the symmetry of the sleeves. I love the symmetry of the gown and the play with the arms. Um, I think it's just a lovely, lovely image that does justice to the piece. Now, this took a long time to photograph. We don't have time, as we mentioned, to photograph everything this way. Sometimes, depending on the intent, it's okay to just take a photo. You know, someone in our office did this. Maybe I even photographed it. I don't remember. And just to photograph it for our database. You know, it's a clear shot. Um, it shows the quality of the stockings. And that's okay. But this would not be okay for a publication that we would do. Right. And uh, Christina, can you, can you hold up the aerofane dress photo again? Just to give you an idea of the tricks of the trade that, and it's all, it's not just Kevin and Christina that are kind of working things out. As I mentioned, our photographers do as well. And um, only a couple of times have our photographers asked to reshoot something that they were not happy with. And we try to accommodate any time that because, you know, they are part of our team. Their name is also on the photo. And so we want them to be as, as happy. Now, when we shot this before, we had kind of more front directional lighting. The way Brian Sanderson caught this shot, which I thought was very innovative, it was really interesting. And it was one of the earlier times that we did this. And then it was so successful. We've done this before. He put a light behind the mannequin. So there is actually a light behind the mannequin 
shooting from behind. And that's why the sleeves and the skirt become illuminated because it sh the fabric is so beautifully sheer that the light just streams through it. And he was able to capture that by putting the light directly behind. There, were a, there was a cord then to the light going off the, the, um, the, the floor of the mannequin, which he then digitally removed later. So again, it's, you know, the photographers experimenting and it's actually really fun to experiment and then it in as you develop ideas um, and techniques you will use them over and over again and refine them um, when we look at uh, sporting uh, excuse me when we look at fabulous we can tell the early photos from the later photos as we developed and got more you know comfortable with photography, we refined um, our techniques and so forth. Now, Christina, we're just about to the end. Oh, it goes wow. by so fast this hour. I have one last question, and it is, what objects in your collection have you not photographed yet that you are dying to photograph on a mannequin? I've got one for myself. Do you have oh, one? Well, I cannot narrow it down. That's so cruel. I think I have a handful, a handful, maybe 10, 19th century pieces that I would love to see photographed on a mannequin. Just just a number of them because we only have flat photos. So I just want to see them completely done up and on a mannequin. So mid 19th century for me. And I know the ones you're talking about. And that the reason why, honestly, we haven't photographed them yet is another aspect is safety, which we've not really talked about. There are some outfits of French couture that we've acquired that we would love to photograph. But you know, they have to go through conservation first before we can safely mount them on a mannequin. So I'm with you. For me, it's actually the photograph that you showed of the corset, the blue corset. You want to redo that. I want to photograph, I'd like to do a project on undergarments because we have really built up in a sensational undergarment collection. And this shot minus the, the at the bottom, the strings hanging down, it's a beautiful shot. It really shows that corset just in all of its grandeur. And we also have a photo of it from the back. So you can see um, it's really pretty. And um, I want to shoot that on a mannequin fully dressed as she would have worn it, not just floating on its own. Because I just love the full head to toe look. Um, to me, that really brings the period to life. I also love when we isolate pieces and just focus on them. It's great. It's two different um, ways of looking at objects. And so I really hope we can at some point dress the mannequin and, and shoot it because it, it'll be absolutely we sensational. We will. We will. Well, we are almost to the end. Christina, do you have any final thoughts? No. no. I want to thank everybody for joining us yes, today in this you. kind of behind the scenes sneak peek of how it is that the Fitted Museum does its photo shoots. You know, if you have any questions, email us. Um, we're happy to answer uh, because there's, you know, we, there's lots of things that we didn't cover. I want to say that in a couple of weeks, our next um, collection conversation is going to be with Dr. Eric Pritchard. We're very excited to uh, have him come to the Fitted Museum to talk with us about one of my favorite 20th century designers, Patrick Kelly. So we look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. Stay safe, wear your masks, and help everybody out. We look, Take care. Bye-bye.